Leading with Influence webinar session. The series is inspired by a recent research piece which we conducted together with Global Leaders in Law and Morrison and Foster to find out what are the most desired characteristics of exceptional GCs. One of the themes that we're going to be exploring today is about humanizing modern workplace relationships. I am delighted to have two fantastic people here on the webinar to explore this topic with me. We've got Morag Barrett, who is a speaker, internationally renowned speaker and author of two books, and uh, somebody that worked across the world with leaders enabling them to, to lead, to inspire and to really create a positive change. We also have Tiffany Chung, who is the partner at Morrison and Foster. There are so many accolades, Tiffany, that I could um, really uh, talk about here today and how inspirational you are. I also know that you have been recognized to be the best of the best as far as the legal practice is concerned for client service. I will leave it at that because I think that there are some parts of each of our stories that speak to humanizing workplace relationships. So I would love to uh, each one of you to um, introduce yourselves, um, bringing the parts of yourselves that you would like to this workshop. A few words about myself, I'm Alex Lazarus and I'm the CEO and the founder of Lazarus and Maverick. We are a global consultancy, absolutely passionate to find what it is that leaders need to rise up to in these challenging times. We perceive leadership to be an act of a whole person endeavor and something of a PNL to us is is a picture of how organizations are relating to their people, to their ideas, to their soul and their potential. So, Morag, over to you. Would love to hear from you. Well, thank you, Alex. I'm coming to you all from Colorado in the US, but grew up in and around the UK. And when it comes to humanizing the workplace, my first career was in commercial finance. And I can remember being told it's not personal, it's business. Well, throughout my career, I've turned that on its head and I can tell you that business is personal and relationships matter. And if we don't focus, especially in 2020, on humanizing the workplace, then we all miss out individually at a team level and an organizational level. So I'm looking forward to the conversation and the questions that you're all bringing for Tiffany, Alex and I to keep the conversation going and inspire and engage you as you take the inspiration you'll hear this morning back into action in your workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I can see comments are coming in already. Buried Ashla, welcome to the webinar. And if there you know, could ever be a better moment to talk about humanizing relationships. Um, just before we came on air, one of my machines just died on me. And it's a, a, a newly purchased, lovely, will not mention the brand. Um, so I'm leaning on the humanity that now Tiffany Chang and you um, can bring um, more right. So perhaps a bit of humor and make me feel at ease. But on a serious note, these are the things that can trigger us, trigger us and trip us up on a day-to-day -day basis. And perhaps now, especially this year, 2020, I have been thinking perhaps the need to be human sneaks up on us even more often than before. So um, Tiffany, uh, welcome to our session. Please tell us a few words about yourself. Sure. Um, th thank you so much for including me uh, on this workshop. I, I wear several different hats in the professional context. So um, a leadership webinar is certainly meaningful uh, to me in a, a lot of different ways. Um, I am a co-chair of our firm's global litigation department um, and relatively recently took on that role. So really finding my way as a leader and, and how to best be a leader for the teams and the clients that, that I work with. Um, in addition to that, I have a very you know, busy class actions practice. Um, I work on a number of different matters defending uh, class action cases in primarily the marketing and privacy arenas. And so it's a growing and busy area of work and, and I'm very committed to the 
I play at work in the, the legal work that I do as well. Um, and in, in another important hat that I wear is I am a mother of two kids, two school-age kids who are distance learning. Um, so, so definitely, Alex, your, your comment about being more human in, in, in these times is, is meaningful to me and certainly hitting home um, because, you know, while we're at home and working through our technology challenges, you know, I have my kids on their Zoom in the room next door and hoping that they're not going to be barging in any, any moment. But, um, but those are, you know, kind of the things a little bit about my background and, and why, you know, this topic is so meaningful to me. Thank you. Um, and there's one part, uh, Tiffany, which I read in your bio is that actually being, if I might just read this, is that also being a mother is something that you channel into the way that you work, the way that you partner to bring the best for your clients and, uh, and your team. Would you mind telling me a little bit more about that? How can you channel that personal side of your life into the work practice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are a number of different ways where I think bringing in one's, you know, non-work life can actually create a stronger team um, in the workplace environment. Um, because certainly in, in the experiences that I've had where I've been working not only with internal teams, you know, other partners or associates, but also with clients, where we can connect on a level that goes beyond just the specific transaction, the specific matter at issue. Um, that has really helped, I think, to forge stronger partnerships among, uh, again, clients and, and other internal team members because everyone has, you know, can share a common bond outside of the work. Mm -hmm. um, helps develop trust. I think it helps develop a sense where, you know, we're all in this together. Um, and that we have each other's backs because, you know, there are going to be some days that are more challenging for others and other days when people are stepping up and other days when, you know, we can commiserate over toddler tantrums or, you know, having a computer or, you know, the <clears throat> and the homeschooling that we're all doing. I mean, all of that, I think, does create a stronger bond so yes. that can work together in a way that is more productive. And I do think it actually does impact the bottom line on a business level too. It helps, I think, to minimize distractions um, that can kind of be in the back of your head if you're not talking about it openly. Um, and if you're open with your team and can push those distractions aside, it really does help everyone focus on the work and create better work product. Mm. Um really like what you said that it does impact the bottom line and i'd like to ask morag i'd like to ask your story because you have a very interesting story coming from the professional um also executive leader identity to becoming somebody that now is a bit of a you know a leadership whisperer you are enabling <laughs> others to be as best as they can you also wrote books about uh, this very topic so this is very important to you one of the books you've written is cultivate the power of winning relationships um i keep saying and i probably said this in the first webinar that leadership um is a mixture of interactions and contexts and we are, you know, on a daily basis, there will be numerous contexts, numerous interactions. And it's not about bringing our best self to the interaction that we simply find easy. That's the easy one. It's also not about winning in a context that I find easy too. Because on a good day, I'm really nice. On a great day, when I get what I want, I'm really nice. But what happens is when we are challenged, like, you know, machines is breaking down, the children coming in, moving goalposts, uh, multiple priorities that are hitting you at all at once and potentially a relationship at work that isn't itself at its best. Morag, you have found a winning formula for that. How does it, first I have to question, how does it speak to the theme of humanizing workplace relationships? And tell me that story from your switching from the business provider to the thought leader. Um, well, I'll build on what Tiffany was saying about wearing multiple hats. And I, too, have three sons, but they're all six foot tall. And certainly early in my career, I made a deliberate choice not to have children until I became a bank manager, because at that time it would have been seen, I perceived that it would have been seen, and I think there's some reality and truth in that, that it would have been a black mark. 
And so when we talk about being able to be authentic at work, it means we need to be able to bring our whole selves, not just compartmentalize, which I was very skilled at early in my career, and focused on independence versus interdependence. And so I mean independence mm. in terms of the home morag was different to the work morag. And the work morag, you gave me a target to go de uh, to achieve, I would go do it. And, you know, with the minimum of supervision and in my own mind, it was because, you know, independence, I've got self-confidence, let me go do it. You've got enough to worry about on your plate, boss person, you can go manage other folks. But what I've realized in that transition is we can go further and faster when we go together, which is where the interdependence comes in. And so I wrote Cultivate, the first book, to provide a language and framework to break down the politics, silos and turf wars that happen in every organization, however large or however small. And it's that infighting between my team is better than your team, or I'm going to hoard the uh, star talent for my success and our success, but in doing so we lose sight of what the group is trying to achieve and how we might get into the exponential benefits by working as allies. And so that's the, the transition that was an epiphany for me and that has made a difference for our clients as we talk about how do we build a team of allies and to your point, Alex, it's easy to be an ally and a best friend at work when things are going well. But as 2020 has shown us, it's the ultimate leadership crucible. And that's the test is who is still standing with you? Who is there to help us to navigate the turbulent times? That is the true test of professional relationships. And as we're seeing personal relationships, too. And if we don't focus on the human side, if we don't focus on the soft skills, I guarantee you're not going to get to the hard results, the business results that you and your organizations aspire to. Thank you. And what was your transition and what caused you to move from being the business maker, so to speak, to being a thought leader? Was that to me? Sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what was the transition? It was that uh, lending millions of pounds to mm -hmm. companies back in the UK in my banking career and wondering, well, why is it? What is the correlation between those that were successful and meeting their goals and their business strategy and cash flow forecasts? Mm -hmm. Those were the ones that invested as much care and attention in how business got done. And it doesn't mean they're skipping through the daisies, there's no conflict, everything's lovely. It meant that they made the implicit explicit around how you and I are going to work together. When we do disagree on a course of action, how we're going to resolve that and decide so that we can move forward together. And that is the pivot that took me from the numbers side of business to the people side and the work that we do through Sky Team in how do we build high performing leaders, high performing teams and high performing yeah. organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I just also wanted to say a word to all our guests and uh, our participants and just have a look. Oh, we've got 109. What a lovely number. Please keep your comments coming in the chat. We would like you to take part in this conversation as well. So please feel free to say hello. Um, and if you have any question to Morag, myself and Tiffany, absolutely use the chat to do that. It's uh, great to see you here. Um, I will share with you, I had a story. So when I was a marketing director at Disney, before I pivoted my career into the space in which you, Marek, and I are in now, I was I received a promotion overnight. And um, it was, I suspected it would happen, but there were no formal uh, advanced warning, so to speak, to, to hand it over to me. Of course, I was absolutely delighted. But as I was driving back home, I was thinking, I'm already so busy. You know, I'm already married to my job. How am I going to now manage double amount of people in my team? And um, as I was driving, I just thought, we need to work less. We just, all of us, we just need to work less. And of course, guess what time I was driving back home having those thoughts. It was probably 10 o'clock, 10 p.m., you know, finding excuses for myself to stay in the office for as long as I could. We definitely had, we, lo we all absolutely loved the job. That was, that was the true, and it was a given. But we also had what I would say an unreflective achievement culture where you didn't stop. You didn't think about what's happening to the rest of your life. So the following morning as I came into the office, I looked across the floor and I thought to myself, 
which one of my direct reports has a fulfilling relationship? Which one of them has engaged in a hobby recently? Which one of them had gone to the gym during lunchtime? And, um, you know, I asked myself further other questions related to a personal and adult development, personal life. And I realized that it really was time to stop working that hard. So I brought everybody into the room and um, I proposed that we will now be finishing work at 5.30. It took us about a month to really get everybody out of the office by 5.30, but it happened. It took us a while and the other uh, executives had to really get used to our internal change of culture. We had to explain ourselves why we were doing that. Uh, we also, I've also told people that my office door is open by four o'clock it is closed because I'm winding down. I'm doing the things I need to do to tidy up in order to go home on time. And it's that feeling when you suddenly find yourself in your area of London at 6.30, the sun is still shining. You see people in parks and you think, yeah, I should be at work, my goodness, I'm out here now. I have to admit, uh, more to what you were saying and you, Tiffany, that it really is paying to the bottom line when you merge and humanize your life, not only workplace relationships, because the amount of motivation that I received from my team and creativity was exceptional. We also had an office policy to say that whoever is staying past six o'clock needs to tell the others why. If it's a case of, <laughs> I'm just checking Facebook, that's okay. But if it's a case of, because I'm behind, let's talk about it. And that was, for us, it was a very, um, really nice time when we transitioned from being obsessed to our work, eating cornflakes and pizzas at 10 p.m. together in the office to actually having lives and, and, and growing and developing as individuals. So thank you, Eric. Thank you. So um, I, I would like to also just introduce a concept of why humanizing a workplace relationship is, is important, even beyond anecdotal, what we know from Tiffany and Morag's your stories. There has been, and, and there is an increasing uh, research coming from various strands of psychology and organizational psychology that talk about how important it is, our sense of belonging, our sense of relatedness and safety with other people. Uh, I see, you know, I'm thinking why, you know, I, I do remember working when paycheck was just almost enough for me, you know, when I would tolerate so much, this is a long time ago, but I'm seeing that people are not after that paycheck anymore to the extent that maybe, you know, we saw in the nineties, for example, you know, back in the 20th century, which we were the catapulted from the second world war into job opportunities like we've never had before. In fact, I think the workplace has never been as robust in social studies as, as maybe hundred odd years ago. So we are going through the most fantastic period of uh, everybody's lives for those who want to work, apparently that we have that variety. And yet we are now seeking more purpose. Do you know why this might be happening, Morag? Well, uh, that just reinforces the research that Dr. Linda Sharkey and I did for our book, The Future Proof Workplace. And certainly as we start looking at Generation Z, that whole purpose and is what I'm doing, not just giving me a paycheck and adding value, but is it filling my soul and adding value to the broader community continues to drive what do we define and look at as a career and a workplace in the 21st century. But we're still stuck with many processes, systems and attitudes from the 20th century and they in themselves are rooted in the Industrial Revolution. And here's what I know from the work that I've done um, with leaders around the world is that there are four questions that underpin every business relationship and every personal relationship, but certainly every interaction at work. And the first two questions are, can I count on you and can I depend on you? These are transactional in nature. These are my business, uh, my banking career relationships. Can I count on you to do your stuff so I can get my stuff done and I can get out of the office by five or six? Can I depend on you to be proactive and go the extra mile? Give me warnings of impending disaster. And often this is where many organizational cultures and business relationships start and stop. You do your stuff, I'll do mine and we'll be okay. But at the pace of change, that's not enough. We need to get to yes to the two transformational questions. Mm. Do I care about you and do I trust you? Now, if you go back to January in this year, when we worked in the same office and I saw you every day and we went for the occasional lunch and I met you for coffee in the break room, it's easy to have four yeses. But here we are in November 
nine months of working at home. I've got my kids that I'm trying to get onto online schooling. I'm sitting here in my bedroom or wherever it is. So can you count on me? Maybe not as consistently as you thought because I've got all these competing priorities. Mm. Um, can you depend on me go the extra mile? Well, maybe, but I've already got 101 different calls on my uh, time. Do I care about you? Well, I have no idea because you haven't just called to see how I'm doing. You only ever mm. call and Zoom me when you need something. Mm. And therefore, do I trust you? Maybe not. So those four yeses have become four at best maybes or four no's, which brings us full circle back to why focusing on the human side, the connection, that sense of belonging is critical in mm -hmm. 2020 and certainly as we're looking now for this marathon sprint continuing into 2021. Mm. Thank you. I just noticed everyone that we have two, three questions in our Q&A and I'll pause to uh, read this out to you. So uh, one that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering we could probably tackle here now is being a human in the workplace is quite stigmatized as a female quality. Do you think this is a problem? How can we encourage men to realize it's in their interest too? So I think it can be quite a controversial topic, depends on the type of industries uh, we work in. Uh, I, as a mum of three sons, I have been very interested in knowing the male psyche. Um, but I wonder, Tiffany, if uh, you have um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, I, I, I certainly, the legal industry is an industry that is, um, you know, probably has challenges with that are similar along those lines. I, I certainly know that um, in terms of humanizing teams and making sure that your teams are high performing, I, I certainly believe that that's, you know, an important principle to, to take to heart whether you're male or female, um, and gender doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it's so important to have that personal investment for your team members. And, you know, taking some examples that, that, that you all raised with respect to just some of the more junior associates who are in different generations, you know, that's, I think, also not gender specific. I mean, there are um, those in those generation that have certain, maybe some expectations to grossly generalize. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it's been helpful to have those who have been in the, in the profession for longer to really rethink the way that we, um, that we are forming teams and that the way that we are leading teams. Um, that personal approach and, and um, to take Morag's words, you know, showing that you care uh, mm. about your teams is so important. Um, and whether that's with a client um, or with, you know, your internal team members or those who you are supervising. Um, and, and this, you know, really does, this topic really does make me think of um, the situation where, you know, at our firm, we have this kind of 360 feedback system where we ask the associates to provide feedback to the partners who are supervising them. And I recall this one comment someone told me about where an associate had said um, about this partner, you know, I would jump into a group of alligators for this partner mm -hmm. because I knew that partner would do it for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's that, that level of investment in your team mm -hmm that I just think makes the team so much stronger because everyone knows that we all have each other's backs. And this is not, you know, a gender specific thing. Everyone should have each other's backs. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone should feel like they care about every single person's success because when you show that to your team members, they will show it, they will demonstrate it towards you as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is just something that it is true that I think when people talk about being caring and actually humanizing, they think mm. of it as something of a gendered characteristic. But really, when you talk about it in a way where you want to have your teams back, you want mm. to be able to invest in your team members, that's, you know, that's not a characteristic um, that I think you can think of as either be, you know, being more stronger with one gender or another. Um, so it, it really is an important 
I think, facet to building a strong team. And again, when you have those teams that are high performing, that are willing to step up for the, for the good of the group, that is just going to impact the, the business at the end of the day. Um, and that's really what is going to, I think, help everyone achieve their goals. Thank you. T Tiffany nailed it there in that, yes, we need to have each other's backs. And it's one of those things, it's easy for us all to say, it's the how do you put that into practice? And whilst I do believe there's a bias or an assumption that being human is a female quality, it doesn't mean that we have to open the kimono completely. And it doesn't mean that we're having uh, emotional <clears throat> releases at work or however you might describe it. And the most powerful way I've seen to bring awareness across the spectrum is through the executive coaching and team building that we're doing. But let's just do it right now. For those of you listening, I want you to think about the team that you would, or the leader, the colleague, that you would jump into that alligator pit that Tiffany talked about. Who is the best boss, best colleague you've worked with? What made them special? And just type it in the chat, not the Q&A bit, but just thinking about that person, just type down into the chat for us a couple of things that makes that person come to mind the one that you would jump into the alligators for, the person you have their back, the person you jump at the chance to work with again. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, you've said humility. Thank you for being a quick typer <laughs> and see what else comes up. I mean, Alex, I know you've had best bosses, best colleagues, best clients. What comes to mind when you think that? Oh, I can, I, I remember one. I, you know, for me, having worked for, Richard Branson, when I was a young uh, immigrant who has come to London with a funny foreign accent and people mm -hmm. were checking my spelling, telling me I don't have a grasp of the British culture well enough. Ugh. And then mm -hmm. I went to, you know, this, then I went to Virgin and nobody even asked me where I was from. They just asked me, what, what do I want to do in 10 years time? To which question I said, it's a really great question. I have no idea. They're like, great, mm -hmm. you hired. And this is the place for me where it shows that organizations, this is my deeply held belief, that I mm -hmm. believe that organizations have a responsibility to look at their community and so-called usage of the human power and our task force as also yeah. a place to continue adult development because we develop throughout our lives. You know, Muhammad Ali said that, you know, give me a man of 50 that still thinks and is the same as the age of 30. He's wasted 20 years. So in the work that we do, we, we, we very, you know, we look at who are you? What's your identity? Uh, what are your, uh, and so this is uh, the things we do at Lazarus is Maverick. We look at your wholesome uh, leadership capability through three lenses. One is your choice, then it's your character, and then it's your connection. They grow continuously. They feed each other. Um, I just wanted to, there, there's a thought that came to my mind uh, uh, that spun from that question about humanizing and potentially allocating that in the sort of a female bucket. And I think that that probably also comes from uh, a slight a misinterpretation what it could mean. Uh, mm -hmm. right? so, because this is not about, sorry, the, there was another study that we, um, together with Lumina Learning, who uh, very kindly collaborated with us on the upcoming Leading with Influence report, where there was a, a study done on what were the true differences between female and male uh, psychometrics in relation mm -hmm. to empathy, for example, and being acquiescing, acquiescing a collabor collaborative, etc. There hasn't really been a, a significant shift or a difference between the genders. So what you were saying, Tiffany, this is not necessarily the intrinsic and the nature. It is nurture. We know that, you know, there has been certain stereotypes that only in the last five years has been, have been a challenge, whether it's a blue or a pink color. I know Mattel are doing amazing work in getting really kind of the gender conversations, uh, making sure that, you know, we do not follow those stereotypes. Um, I, I am confident that by the time my kids hit workplace, um, what considered to be human it's the personal decency. It's mm -hmm. speaking to values of fairness, inclusivity, really empowering generative dialogues and creating safe cultures that enables everybody to come up with ideas. We, you know, we are in a knowledge economy today. My personal view is that we will be in the ideas economy tomorrow. Knowledge will just not be enough. We'll not have enough use cases as we see even now in certain expert driven industries. We have to be creative and to be creative, we have to feel safe. 
We do. Oh, I love that. And safety is a, a critical one. And when you look at all of these characteristics that people have shared, compassion, standing up for me and the team, empowering, going back to what you described, Alex, about giving opportunities and seeing potential in you, um, it is all about the human side. Mm. And when it comes back to the original question that sparked my thought, you've just done your mini survey here. My guess is that all of you were thinking, some of you were thinking of male leaders, some of you were thinking of female leaders. So going back to the original question, is being human a female quality? No, because you've just proven it. And it reminds me of the Maya Angelou quote, people won't remember what you did or said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Mm. So to get past that bias, you have to go first whatever's happening in your organization and i've delivered this sort of research in gold mining where it's very hierarchically dog eat dog we've had um engineers and and miners coming in from essentially the 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 big trucks that they're driving and sharing their emotions about what drives for example a safety culture so here's my challenge to you the person that you were thinking of as you responded to my question I want you to send them a LinkedIn message, send them a text, send them an email that says, hey, you were on this webinar thinking about best colleagues. You came to mind and here's why. Mm. And in doing so, you're breaking down these barriers. You're demonstrating what it means to be human and you're building and nurturing a sense of connection that may have just been on soft boil. Well, now you're heating that relationship back up again. Take the time to connect. It makes a huge difference. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm loving seeing the, uh, even the use of loving, I've never really used to use that word, but hey, we are humanizing workplace relationships. Mm -hmm. um, I am really enjoying the comments that are coming in. You know, we talked about what you saw in the, the person that you asked, uh, Amora, what, how did this person make you feel? What is it? What was it about that person? And uh, some of the comments talks about humility. Uh, it's about finding opportunity for me to develop professionally, mm -hmm. which is, I hear that so much. And, you know, the, the, the relationship between how you are as a manager and a leader and your talent retain, uh, retention is high, very, very high. Mm -hmm. People don't leave jobs, they leave their managers usually. Uh, but other comments is empathetic, always a positive and can-do attitude. Now more than ever, I think 2020 has really uh, given us a, a great you know, reminder that a smile will go a long way because yeah, we just don't I, know, right? Tiffany, I, did you, yeah. I mean, I was going to observe that what I, I have seen a common thread in what people see in a strong manager, none of it seems to be about technical expertise. You know, this person was mm -hmm. a really great engineer or a really great lawyer or a really, you know, great whatever that, you know, doctor. Let's just fill in the profession. Um, it is not about... It, technical expertise, and even though many of these supervisors and managers probably did have that, but the focus on mm -hmm. being a good leader is really more on the softer skills, and that's what people remember, and that's what mm -hmm. people take away with them, um, and that's what will help build the strong team, and I also love Morag's um, suggestion to folks that they reach out and let people know that this is what worked this is what impacted them because mm -hmm. when you tell people and give people positive feedback about things they are doing right it's going to encourage them to do it more um and and have that impact on even more people down the line and um, be able to grow that strength so I think it's also really important to do that, not only with the folks who are supervising you, but the folks who, you know, you may be supervising and report directly to you, you know, give credit, thank people for doing a good job. Um, and at the same time, you know, if there is feedback that could be given, you know, either up or down or sideways, mm -hmm. uh, help someone improve, give that mm -hmm. feedback because you know then it'll show that you're invested in that person and then it'll hopefully also help that person do a better job thank you i would like to uh, ask uh, we have another questions from q a um so i'll just like to swiftly move into that as well and just a comment about the upcoming leading with influence report some of the characteristics uh, i will not mention all of them here but the one trait that came overwhelmingly as one of the top six is working together. So we, there was a very simple question. What, do they, what, what does the world in which we operate as GCs require us to rise up to? One of them was conceptualizing strategies, which I'm not surprised about, but the other one to be interpers interpersonally astute and also the ability to work 
together. Um, one comment from um, somebody here. Thank you very much for um, en enabling us to answer these questions as well. Here's the question. How do you think COVID-19 will change our working landscape? Will we see permanent changes? And what will this mean to the general counsel as a leader and the culture of the organizations? Tiffany, could I just ask your perspective from the legal perspective? Because what Morag and I can bring is tons of other industries, but I'm particularly keen on your view whether COVID-19 working from home and all that we have seen are going to make observable practical shifts in how we work. Yeah, I, I, I think that it, it will. And on the most kind of logistical, practical level, I do think that before the pandemic hit, there were probably some companies, some you know firms who were more reluctant to have widespread remote work just because everyone is used to being in the office. That's you know, everyone does um, appreciate it, you know, as do I, the ability to walk down to someone's office and pop in and ask a question and, you know, have that kind of spontaneous interaction, um, which I do think there's a lot of value um, in bringing, but I, but I do think people have also acknowledged that you can be quite productive, you can have strong teams, even when you're not necessarily physically in the same space every day or every work day. Um, and I do think that that attitude shift does enable for more flexibility for, for people who are dealing with things at home. You know, there probably are going to be situations where whether you're working at a large company or at a large firm where, you know, you're just not, it's not going to be convenient to be in the office because that's the day, you know, you have a parent-teacher conference or you have something else that you've got to deal with. And I do think that it's going to become more, you know, accepted given that we have seen that there are lots of attorneys um, in the industry working very productively, um, even though there is not as much, you know, quote unquote, face time or ability to see people in the office anymore. So I do think that that's um, been a benefit in just allowing more flexibility for people to work when they, you know, when, it, when they can work. And to your point, Alex, like it's, mm -hmm. you know, not going to always be at the same time as everybody else, but you know, when, when you get the work done. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's going to certainly affect a change mm -hmm. um, as, we, as we get out of the pandemic. Thank you. And I, and I suppose what's shifted really, and I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about some of our clients, we ran a leadership development session last year, 2019 in September. And one of the big, big things that was at that time being discussed is how do we allow people to work from home? And that discussion was laden with fears and assumptions that people would not work very well at home. Morag, what are you seeing? So just back to the question, do you think COVID-19 are going to, uh, is going to change how we work? Well, I think it has changed how we work. And the key here is, is what, have, what are we doing to embed success for the longer term? So in March, when the first work from home requests came out or orders, we reacted. It was hair on fire. It's can you grab your laptop and go. But don't worry, we'll be back by the summer. We'll be back by the fall. We'll be back, oh, sometime next year. And what that has meant is that organizations have adopted good habits and poor habits. Mm -hmm. And now is the time, I think, to make the implicit explicit, to recalibrate what does it mean to be part of this organization and the culture? Whereas before you had the mothership with the pretty couches and the break room and you got to know and feel what it meant to work for this organization, well, now we have 5,000 head offices as we're all working out of our um, own homes mm. so talking about how do we role model um, teamwork how do we role model collaboration how do, what needs to change and certainly what I'm seeing with clients is things like office hours I will be here at my desk my zoom room will be open at four o'clock every Thursday drop in don't drop in I'm here for those impromptu conversations that Tiffany mentioned we're getting more creative around how do we replace the water cooler ad hoc conversations with structured spontaneity. And we're also integrating work back into life by say having no meeting times from eight till 10 in the morning so mm -hmm. that we can get our kids onto online school. But doing that is one conversation at a time and making the implicit explicit. Don't assume 
that even the people who report to you are working from the same page and definition of success. Mm. So I would encourage you all to invest the time now in having those conversations so that you can move forward together and where there is a disconnect and the old presenteeism is your jacket on the back of the chair, you need to be there from 10 till three. Well, let's be clear about what that is so that there are, we're not blind by the we do, as somebody said earlier on, feel set up for success versus being set up for failure. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Morag. Um, the, uh, I really like what you said about definitions because we do have different definitions even of one the same thing. What I, would I recommend leaders do if you have a team is to even ask each member of the team in a team exercise, what are your deeply held values um, that really need to be a part of this team. Otherwise, if this value is not here, you're just out of here. Now, I know that companies talk about values a lot, but this is taking it to a slightly different level. Once you have got written those six values, then ask your team members to lay them, you know, could be on the screen, could be in merging them in a PowerPoint, get people to vote for the ones that are the most important for the whole group. You'll be left with six. Um, respecting that, of course, those that have not been perhaps, you know, voted up on by the majority are still very important and we respect those too. Once you have those top six, ask people to list 10 different behaviors that express and demonstrate mm -hmm. that that value is lived up. It's amazing. You will see that if I, whatever I think is respect to you, mm -hmm. Tiffany, to you, Marag, to you, Daniel, could be something different. And it's, the, it's, it's defining what it actually means, as I say to my children, I say to my nearly 13-year-old, uh, saying respect is a verb that carries a lot of different behaviors here. <laughs> it's not just the word. Um, uh, Daniel, I really like what you're saying here. Daniel Slampy, mm -hmm. thank you for your comment. You were saying here to the point of one of the panelists, we should not miss the opportunity to say thank you or a job well done or to report um, to, a, uh, to, to, excuse me, or a teammate. Too often in my experience, managers miss these opportunities when they arise. These interactions build connections that bring uh, being going forward. Thank you. That's a very, um, a very nice thought as we are moving on to the, mm -hmm. the remaining part of our webinar. And I can see um, there are so many fantastic comments, which I really hope that while we are holding the conversation, um, all our participants and uh, still, we're going over 100. This is really good, guys. There are 100 of us here, over 100 of us here still on this webinar. Fantastic results. And I, I can see there's a lot of wonderful uh, chats and comments and conversations about speak the truth all the time, but with kindness. Wonderful. Acknowledge hard times. Um, we have true soft skills. I continue to think it's, you know, strongly soft. It's, uh, it's, it's really way forward. Uh, one couple of things about what research also about the human brain in neuroscience tells us about how to motivate people in tough times. So, of course, we talked about relatedness and belonging, which is very important. I really like, Tiffany, how you exemplify that in your leadership uh, and how you collaborate with your team. The other thing it's important to remember is that that stick and carrot is just no longer enough. It's no longer about a paycheck. Um, it may sound controversial in times where we are you know, uncertain about what's going to happen to marketplace, but to get somebody to be truly motivated, to tap into their internal intrinsic motivation, you have to give people a sense of autonomy, micromanaging, checking up on them all the time. It diminishes trust. It sends a message, you are not capable, you are not able. And we think, well, you know, once we pass 19, we are adults, we should have strong enough self-esteem. If you disagree, <laughs> If you agree, let me know. But it is, um, so autonomy is the one thing. The other thing is mastery. If we are just doing the same thing we've always been done with no, a chink of hope that we'll learn something, that's very demotivational. And that is about humanizing workplace relationships. That's about being human. This is about our psychology. If you're interested to uh, find out more about what drives people, there's a great book called Drive by uh, Daniel Pink about exactly that, how we've moved from understanding of motivation to what internally drives us and how it can give people some superpowers where even on a bad day, they can perform really well. Um, the other thing about hum being human, what it means is that we all bring different uh, personalities to the table. Some of us are great and capable of taking charge and being very highly logical and being very sociable and demonstrative, you know, smiling, you see what you get. And then there'll be other people who need a bit more private space. 
time to think. Don't put me on the spot. Uh, if I'm more formal than you who are more casual, respect that too. That still is very much about humanizing workplace relationship, which is understanding the diversity from you know, all different angles and respecting that we do bring different personalities, different styles of working, different human needs that come together. Um, that sounded a little like a lecture, apologies for that, but I'm so passionate about not missing out on the basic things, on the basic things. And that's because I work with uh, introverted leaders who say to me, this really is me being human. I am under pressure to be someone else I am not. So let's just not forget the quiet, quieter types who like that privacy. That is also giving them the human respect. Um, let's have a look if we have another question. Or maybe, um, Tiffany, uh, I'd like to ask you what, uh, moving forward, when it comes to, again, your profession, what uh, are your top three tips on humanizing workplace relationships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, I, th there are, I think, quite a few things we've already discussed and, and mm -hmm. definitely agree with much of what Morag and, and you, Alex, have been, have been saying. Um, but in addition to those things, and maybe to layer on it and be more specific about some of the things we've discussed is, you know, one, I would say focusing on partnerships um, that is more holistic than transactional, right? Look at, look at the entire partnership as a whole, rather than looking at a specific, you know, piece of work or a specific litigation matter. And, you know, in, in the work that I do, it would, it would translate into, you know, looking at your partnership with your clients that extend beyond this particular matter, but look at counseling them, you know, on an overall strategy, the overall business strategy, representing the company in a way that promotes its brand and culture. Because that, I think at the end of the day, will help show that you're invested in your partners in-house. It'll show that you're, you know, invested in their professional development and their success. And, um, you know, doing well by them, I think, helps strengthen the, the team and the partnership you have with clients. So focusing on partnerships and, and looking holistically is one tip I would say. A second um, is to lead through service. You know, as you're leading your teams, think about, you know, not so much um, what the teams can do for you and what they should be doing, what they should be do doing better, but what can you do for each of your team members? to help support them and to help their success. And I do think that that, you know, results in a situation where every team member is focused much more on what can they do to serve the rest of the team um, and the group and not focus so much on what they're, you know, what they're getting. Um, so leading through service, I think, is another important principle that seems to be and has been effective, at least in, in, in my organization. Um, and then third um, to, is to give opportunities to the junior team members. Um, invest in their professional development. Um, give them ownership. Trust them to, to take on responsibility. I think that's something that really helps get, um, give purpose to, to the work that is being done. It helps to show the investment in, and that you care about, about what they're doing and in their development. And you know, one of the ways at least our firm does that is through these um, blogs that we, that we post. Um, and our litigation team has a class actions blog and the associates are the ones who take ownership of that blog. They're the ones who come up with the thought leadership they're the ones who collaborate with partners um, on writing the blog posts and you know they're the ones who are really building their external profiles through doing it so you know it's it's a way to really give ownership and give show that you really trust for the associates to do something and that will benefit their careers in the long run thank you thank you very much fantastic a lot of uh, really great tips and very relevant to our audience. And also to you, our dear audience, uh, if you have ideas and top tips on how to humanize workplace relationships, um, please feel free to use the chat to share your thoughts on that as well. Morak, what would be your top three? So my top three, I'll go back to my opening introduction. You cannot be successful in business or in life unless you are successful in cultivating winning relationships. So tip number one is 
when it comes to humanizing the workplace, when it comes to having effective relationships at work, what's your definition? What, how do you want others to feel in your presence? Because if you can't articulate it, how do you know if you're doing it? Which brings me to point two and the point you made earlier, which is identify the three to five habits, the behaviors that you're going to demonstrate consistently, not just on the good days, but especially on the tough days to deliver that vision for a humanized workplace. And then tip number three is to pause long enough on your hamster wheel to learn and adjust to reflect on did you do your best to demonstrate those behaviors to create that environment and to humanize your workplace to seek out feedback from others as to what they value in you and what you could do differently to help ensure their success so if you do those three things if you can define what humanizing the workplace means for you if you can identify and consistently demonstrate the three to five behaviors so that you live it every day and then three, if you are reflecting and learning and adjusting your game as new information comes to light, you are the pebble in the pond that can affect change. And don't worry about everybody else, but articulate yours, hold yourself accountable. And I promise you will see a change in the culture for your team and the results that you're delivering. And as a result, people will say, well, what is it that you're doing? I want a bit of that. And before you know it, that ripple has gone across the whole of your pond. So define, do, reflect. Wonderful, thank you. We have one more suggestion from our audience, which is work on listening skills, openness to hearing new and different ideas. Mm -hmm. I like this one, Daniel, and um, Morag, I should have longer acknowledged um, and Jules, uh, Tiffany contributions here to this last point. Um, so forgive me for cutting it a little short, only because we have only two minutes left until we finish the webinar. Um, work on listening skills and be open to hearing new ideas and different ideas. It's one of the exercises that I also do uh, on uh, group leadership workshops where we uh, discuss how important it is to listen and especially to acknowledge new ideas as well and cognitively intellectually all our participants know absolutely it is i know how important it is and then halfway through the workshop we surprise them with an idea and the facial expressions that come upon them which they're not aware of <laughs> are um, obviously they're, they're, they are there to make a point, but we are saying it shows, it just shows on your face when you disagree. You have to, it's not just about putting on a fake face, but internally really asking yourself, even if the entire idea isn't great, which parts of the idea could be good, could be explored further? Can we chunk down silly, crazy, uh, uh, radical ideas and pick and tease something out of those ideas that really could improve processes, maybe not here, but somewhere else. It really is about opening conversations in a different way than we've had them before. Non-linear conversation, using a more creative tools, which I'm you know, a big fan of, whether it's agile, whether it's different coaching questions, whether it's um, using uh, debating skills even, you know, some, some of the uh, children are making, those who have had debating skills, uh, lessons in their curriculum they tend to do, do much better in the workplace later on because they have been taught what i call also practical empathy which is if i can't always know how you're really feeling because i'm built differently internally my dna is different i might be scoring quite low in empathy in my psychometric tests but practically i have trained myself to shift into your perspective and if i still don't know what is it like being you i can ask i can have the courage and tools to ask these questions. What's important for you in this? What's in it for you? Uh, so that conversations are flowing in the right direction where really being human means who we are and how we are is not diminished by a surprised face or a roll of eyes. So what will be the last thought, Morag, from you? It's been really wonderful having you here. I always loved hearing uh, your, your keynotes and how you talk about your work. And can I just ask about those earrings that you're wearing? 
So this is a gift from one of my team, Ruby. And if you want to know how about humanizing the workplace, she sent them to me completely out of the blue and they have had a ripple effect. They were my favorite at the moment. And so it is, it goes back to, I think it was Daniel who said earlier on, just saying thank you, just catching people by surprise, just because we're working in a disconnected environment doesn't mean that we can't forge the connections that humanize the workplace and create that sense of belonging. So that is where the earrings came from. I'll send you a link afterwards, Alex. <laughs> yes, please. I really like them. And what a wonderful story. As you are, you so know, there's, it's all dangling there. You're surrounded yeah. physically by your team members. <laughs> well, yeah. I have recently, last week, I received a postcard. And, you know, how often do you really look at that sort of mail mm -hmm. at the bottom of the of your front door? But I picked it up and I just thought, this lady looks like someone I know. And of course, this was a, a former colleague of mine. And on the back of the postcard, it says, I miss you. And that Aww. really made me very teary. That was a beautiful oh. touch. That's a, just a beautiful gesture. Um, Tiffany, what's your last closing thoughts from this session? Yeah, I mean, my, my last closing thought, I think, is, is similar to, to what we've heard, which is uh, absolutely give credit to people. Give credit where credit is due and do it publicly. You know, when people do things well and, um, and you appreciate the job that they've done, you know, let everybody know um, that this success, this win in litigation was because, you know, this associate came up with this great idea. Um, and so I, I just think that giving acknowledgement and credit where credit is due is so important and meaningful to people. And then it helps encourages um, that positive behavior moving forward. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Tiffany Chang, a partner from Morrison and Foster. Thank you so much, Morag Barrett, CEO and founder of Sky Team and author. Thank you, Global Leaders in Law, for getting us here together. And uh, thank you to all the wonderful people who have been with us, who stayed with us, uh, commented. Uh, so many great comments. Even now I can see from Susanna. Thank you. Encouraging people to grow and give their best. Triggers mm -hmm. our own professional success. So that is probably the best thought we could close on. Thank you everyone so much. And I look forward to uh, meeting you all again to our third and final edition of this series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, everyone.